today we're going to do a webinar. This webinar is entitled 16S Metagenomics, a case study for troubleshooting spoilage sources. My name is Joe Heinzelman. I'm the Director of Business Development for our food safety genomics business. And today we're going to jump into some data that really helps people understand how metagenomics data uh, helps tell a story which will uncover unique issues within a processing environment. So three kind of takeaways that you'll see today from this data set is how we're able to see unculturable organisms that could cause spoilage. Uh, we'll show how the metagenomics is able to help tell this story on where these issues are coming from within a processing facility. And what we're going to go through a data set here and these slides uh, to help kind of pull it all together. As a reminder, if you don't remember, there are two additional webinars. What we've tried to do is break up these this we, uh, presentation into three kind of bite-sized chunks, uh, depending on your application and what you really want to get after. The second one will be more focused around the differences between whole genome sequencing shotgun metagenomics and 16S metagenomics, that's in December. Last one will be uh, metagenomics and the application for shelf life studies and clean label formulations. So a lot of the impetus for clean label and reformulation is causing microbial spoilage concerns and issues. We can show you how metagenomics helps address some of those and uh, arm scientists to help tackle those concerns. All those are available on our website, uh, and if you would like, we can send you the link after the webinar. So as we kind of get into a little bit of background, I would like to kind of take you a step back and have you think about genomic testing in three big areas. The first one is pathogen outbreak. So we're talking about uh, whole genome sequencing, any type of subtyping methods all kind of fall into this big first bucket. The next one is uh, microbiome and spoilage troubleshooting. This is for maybe non-pathogenic organisms, microbiome analysis for sanitation verification, all that fills in, falls into that middle bucket. And the last one is what we call food fraud. So this is your meat species identification, uh, identity testing, food fraud, all, all these applications can leverage next generation sequencing to help provide better data and additional insights. So the first kind of concept I really want to drive home is this idea of a microbiome. Microbiome is just a $64,000 word to help us talk about how microorganisms relate to each other in a close and that are close in proximity. And there's three things that I want to, us to think about as we think about the microbiome. First one is viable but not culturable. Our ability to identify and quantitate microorganisms is often limited by our culture method. It's served us well so far in terms of our progression of food safety and food quality over the decades, uh, but this is I think these new technologies are going to help us understand some things that we wouldn't have been able to see with traditional media. And that kind of leads into the next point is media biases. Especially with anaerobic organisms, these biases that we have with tryptic soy agar or tryptic soy broth really tend to lead our analyses and our investigations to a specific answer, and that might not be the best approach. So this is a data set from a 16S metagenomics. Um, what you're really looking at on the x-axis are different sample types. Okay, so on the x-axis, each bar represents a different sample. Each color is a different microorganism. The size of the bar represents the amount of microorganisms in the particular sample, and they're relative to each other. Okay, we're going to get into, this is the data set we're going to get into. Uh, as we kind of take a step back, now that we see what a data set looks like, each sample, if we were to do this through traditional methods, would have to kind of go through this generic process. We're doing a dilution and an isolation. 
maybe on a uh, triptych soy agar or VRBGA. Then we get into initial slant and ID. We still have interpretation. And then there's some type of final confirmation step, often a biochemical ID, your API strips. Uh, maybe you're doing traditional 16S typing at this point, or even um, multi toff for an ID. The point is here is that for each different microorganism, you'd have to go through this process. And it all depends on that first step. In addition to having this be an iterative process, you'd have to be able to grow it up to identify it. And what we'll see in some of the data sets is there's kind of some unique microorganisms that we're seeing in our data that we have here today, but we're also seeing this in some of the other data sets that we've been running as a service. One last point that I want to get into before we get into the data is there's a difference between 16S metagenomics and shotgun metagenomics. For 16S, what we're doing is we're amplifying one specific region of a bacterial genome, which helps us identify that particular organism. This happens out of either a product or from an environmental sponge. And what this means is that we aren't going through those dilution or isolation steps. We're, we're going straight to the sample, we're obtaining those bacteria, and then we're starting the sequencing process. Very similar to shotgun metagenomics, the difference there is the amount of data and how, uh, how we approach that from a sequencing standpoint. So one of the things we've seen with 16S metagenomics as compared to, to whole genome sequencing shotgun metagenomics is a sensitivity on, on clean surfaces because there is a PCR amplification. We, we, we like what this data is telling us, uh, especially in a food production context. And this is how it, it, it looks, so we get samples in, we do the sample extraction, we do PCR, we're doing a sequencing on a MySeq, and then we get in the data analysis. Okay, so the case study that we have here today is from our manufacturing environment. If you're not familiar, we manufacture a Solaris, it's a rapid microbiological test system, and uh, they're aseptic fill using traditional uh, bacterial medias. What we did for this experimental design is we included both raw materials, which are supposed to be sterile, and what that means is any type of bacterial con contamination uh, would, would be considered a spoilage event. And we went through and sampled multiple different sites, some raw materials, uh, and we're using this as part of that uh, comparison between spoiled and non-spoiled samples. And this is going to give us an understanding of the facility microbiome or microbiota, and that's going to lead us some, to some root cause analysis. So a little bit of background about our manufacturing facility. This is a clean room class 100, uh, but I think what you'll see here today is that conceptually this applies to any type of food manufacturing where you've got uh, a product that has a bacterial profile. Uh, we were doing some routine monitoring and uh, identification of isolates. And we saw this as a unique opportunity to use metagenomics to look at the whole facility and how bacteria were exchanging between sites and locations and the product. So as we kind of get back into the data, there's a couple of things um, I'll remind you. So as we talked about before, on the x-axis, each one of that, these represents a different microbiological swab. The color that, colors that you see here are different microorganisms and the size of this bar represents the abundance of that microorganism. So on the left-hand side here, what you're looking at is nearly all Staphylococcus and the sample is on the left, and then you can see that it's kind of sporadic throughout the facility. So the first thing that we like to do in these types of analysis is pull out the product. And so what would you, what you could imagine here is that if a, a product had passed our quality standards, there wouldn't be any type of bacteria. And what you see in these is this, in this contamination event, we're seeing four different key bacteria, the Staph, Pseudomonas, Meothermus, and Brevi bacteria. And there's another interesting piece of data we can pull out from this, this slide right here. What we're looking at are uh, two different contamination events. Specifically, these, these samples here, and I'll pull the eraser off, those samples there in the middle, right here, have a mixed flora that you see in these contamination events. On the bookends here for the staph and the meothermus, only one bacteria dominates that contamination event. And that's gonna help in our analysis. 
So as we kind of look into what these bacteria represent, think about staph and pseudomonas are pretty ubiquitous. Uh, staph and brevibacterium are coming in from people, whether that's soil or hair or whatever. Um, the really interesting one is Meothermus. So if we if we look for Meothermus within the data set, what you can see is that if we start from the least abundance to the and and move forward, you can see from S4 to S19 it grows in abundance. Then from S19 to S30 it gets even bigger, and that is kind of helping us point to S47, which re represents the contaminated product. And what this me what this correlates to these are environmental samples from a, a hot water bath a table adjacent to the hot water bath and a drain and it's going from smallest to largest so the smallest abundance was in the drain table was the meet the second bar we showed and s30 on the left hand side is that hot water bath what's really interesting is if you look up meothermus it's a thermophile it forms biofilms it can be resistant to certain biostatic cleaners. All this means was that when we were in our manufacturing process as a heat source we were using a water bath, we were cleaning and draining the water, we'd come back after our sanitation event, uh, re-inoculate it with water, warm it up and we'd have an opportunity for the biofilm to go uh, reproduce proliferate and cause issues. So what you'll see in the next data set is we went in there with some corrective actions. We pulled out the water bath, found a new heat source and completely removed that. And the next data set is centered around a sanitation. So there's kind of two things I want you to take away. The first one when you see this data set is that there's no meothermus. So from the first initial metagenomics run, we're able to identify the source and a way to prevent it from happening again. All right, so in this data set, what we've done is we've centered um, half the samples around uh, pre-sanitation and half post-sanitation. So if you remember the bacteria that we were really worried about is Staph, Brevibacterium, uh, and what we're seeing is uh, Brachybacterium and Detia in the uh, pre-cleaning. So this is after some run time. What we see post-sanitation is really pretty interesting because we've been able to successfully remove almost all the Staphylococcus, which is one of our key bacteria that are uh, causing the contamination, and we're seeing Brevibacterium and Brachybacterium. So if we look into what those bacteria are, they kind of help uncover why they are there. It's helping tell the story about the microbiome of this manufacturing facility. So Brevibacterium is a mesophile. It's halophilic. Alcohol intolerance is pretty ubiquitous like we talked about. Um, the other thing, I mean, one of the really kind of key things here is that alkaline, the alkaline tolerance and the halophilic. When we looked at kind of the corrective actions and looked at the cleaners and sanitizers that were being used in these facilities, this facility, we're using an alkaline cleaner, the uh, phenylphenol and paratertiary amiphenol are both alkaline in nature. So if we look at how we're cleaning and what impact that has on the microbiome, now we have a, at least an understanding of where these bacteria are coming from and what we might need to do. So we're looking at the, the rotation of the acids and bases within this cleaning bacteria. We're looking at how uh, brevi bacterium could be introduced through people. And, the, uh, and as I said before, we've removed the water bath, so our contamination source of meothermus has been removed. So hopefully with this data set, I, I think you, you hopefully you understand exactly how metagenomics is very different than what you might be seeing with whole genome sequencing databases and outputs with phylogenetic trees and how the changing abundance and presence of bacteria through a manufacturing process can start to tell a story of how things are moving, what the environment's actually like, and the impact that has on product quality. So there's one question we get all the time, is uh, what about Salmonella and Listeria? So this, this is a, uh, has resolution to the genus, so we can't go beyond Listeria species. 
we can in our bioinformatics pipelines turn off these bacteria and the kind of the, our understanding is you'll have your own food safety programs in place to mitigate and monitor and address these hazards and for a spoilage investigation we can turn these off for that uh, particular experiment and what you see in the two red boxes are samples that had been spiked with a listeria species and as you can see in this reporting event the do, these do not show up in this analysis so how we typically like to approach uh, metagenomics projects is we like to sit down and talk to you uh, one of the key things that you'll see is the uh, metadata is really important so designing how many samples are coming in from product or from the environment or from raw materials uh, we've got some experience now we've done a few few of these data sets and we can kind of help walk you through that process and help co coordinate the samples and then when those come off we can help uh, support the data interpretation and help you understand what you're seeing because we are seeing a few of these data sets we've got a couple of documents that if you're interested we can uh, have them sent to you one of them is the uh, submission guideline. We do have some recommendations for the particular type of sponges that we validated the service on. Uh, we've got some sampling recommendations and then the other thing are the submission forms that have a lot of the uh, data capture elements. So we can walk you through kind of the key things that you see or would want to capture to help that data interpretation become a lot easier. So just as a reminder, what, what we're talking about today is a service that we are offering. We are using the Illumina MySeq. Uh, if we kind of want to get into the details a little bit, um, we do all the extraction. You send us in both environmental swabs or products. And what we do is we start to do that analysis. We do the extraction for you. And then 14 days after uh, the res all the samples have been to our lab, you'll have a report. Uh, this is part of a suite of products. If you're not familiar with NeoSeq as a brand of Neogen and this, uh, the service that we run out of our Lincoln, Nebraska genomics facility, it also includes NeoSeq STEC for ID and confirmation. This is a 24-hour uh, ID service that does the top seven uh, E. coli serogroups. The other one is salmonella serotyping, uh, three to five day turnaround time, and this uses a MySeq as well. We talked about 16S metagenomics. We also do some of the food fraud aspects of this, which is meat species identification. And we are working for working towards whole genome sequencing services that will be kind of above and beyond what you see out there today. So with that, that kind of concludes this kind of brief data set. I would love to take some questions and maybe ask, uh, answer some of those. Um, based on what you've seen here in this data set. And if you have any uh, other comments, you can either find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or email any of your sales reps or email me, um, and we can start to answer these questions. Thanks again for your time. Talk to you soon.